I'm pleased to introduce Neil Ferguson to Politics and Prose. Ferguson is the Milbank Family Se Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and a visiting professor at Tsinghua University, Beijing. He is the author of 15 books, including The War of the World, The Ascent of Money, Civilization, The Great Dege Degeneration, and Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. He also writes weekly columns for London Sunday Times and the Boston Globe. In his newest book, The Square and the Tower, Ferguson reveals our bias toward typical hierarchical, hierarchical view of world history and argues that social networks are the real drivers of change. Although the term social network conjures up images of Facebook posts and Twitter feeds, they have existed long before our digital age, arguably since the beginning of civilization. Although traditional historians scoff at the idea of an all-powerful network like the Illuminati controlling the world, there is an undeniable draw to this idea of a network running the world. And just because conspiracy theorists fantasize about it doesn't mean that networks aren't real. As Eric Schmidt, executive chairman of Alphabet Inc., writes, the square in the tower brilliantly illuminates the great power struggle between networks and hierarchies that is raging around the world today. Silicon Valley needed a history lesson, and Ferguson has provided it. Now, please join me in welcoming Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Katie. It's lovely to be here. Bookshops are my natural milieu, and so I feel at home. I'm going to tell you why I decided to write this book, and I'm going to tell you what I learned from writing it. And then you're going to ask me difficult questions. And then I'm going to sign some books. And then I'm going to rush to Dulles Airport and fly to San Francisco to get home to my wife and uh, small children, including the newborn, Wee Campbell, who's just three months old. So that means that the signing might be kind of hurried. Uh, because if I don't make that plain, my little domestic network <laughs> <laughs> may suffer an outage. Uh, it's true. I wanted to teach Silicon Valley a history lesson. I moved to Stanford just a year and a half ago, slightly less. And I was amazed that when I got there, the prevailing attitude was that history began around about the time of the Google IPO. <laughs> and everything before that was the Stone Age and of no consequence and not worth studying or knowing about. Naturally, I was somewhat offended uh, to encounter this attitude. And so I thought to myself, why have I got a sense of deja vu? What is it about the attitude I am encountering here in this place that seems familiar. And then I remembered the attitude in Silicon Valley just a couple of years ago was exactly like the attitude I remember on Wall Street in around about 2005, six. We are the masters of the universe. You pathetic academic <laughs> historian have nothing to tell us. Now, some of you may know that around about 2005, five, six, I began work on a book called The Ascent of Money, which was designed to teach Wall Street a history lesson. And as it turned out, that was quite good timing because as the book was published, the financial crisis began. Uh, it was published just a few weeks before Lehman Brothers blew up. So. When I encountered that same sense of, we don't need history, we have no use for it, our apps, our platforms are so awesome, I thought it's, it's the same problem. They think history doesn't apply to them, but it does. So the idea of this book is a little bit the ascent of money goes to Silicon Valley. It is the idea that, yeah, history does apply to the big technology companies, it does apply uh, yes to Facebook and, and to Twitter. And the starting point of, of the analysis is that, that Silicon Valley did not invent social networks. That social networks have always existed. They don't in fact require any technology 
uh, to function on surprisingly large scales and even high speeds. Technological determinism has created the illusion that something entirely new has been created, whereas all that has happened is that social networks have become bigger and faster than ever before. But that is a quantitative change. I don't believe it is a profound qualitative change. And therefore, we can learn from the past things that are relevant to our seemingly uniquely networked age. The other reason that I wanted to write this book was to try and explain networks and network signs to historians. Uh, because it's a two-way street. People who work on the past tend to be very casual in the way that they use terminology uh, like networks. And I, I've been struck by the fact that only quite recently have scholars began, begun to use social network analysis in any systematic way in, in historical research. And the book does its best to showcase some of this really impressive and interesting research. Uh, for example, I, I draw heavily on some terrific work that's being done at Stanford on the Enlightenment network, graphing the Enlightenment as a network of, of scholars and thinkers connected by correspondence and by publication. But what you'll notice if you read the book is that the coverage, this kind of scholarship, is quite patchy. So we know quite a lot about some networks, but nothing at all about others. We still don't have a good history, for example, of how the Nazi party functioned uh, as a network, or for that matter, the Bolshevik party that caused the Russian Revolution. So the book in some ways is an exhortation to historians to be more systematic in the way that they study networks and to try to learn some things from network science. Network science is an amazingly interdisciplinary thing. I was trying to teach myself about networks so that I could write more coherently about them, more analytically about them, and I discovered that I had to be a little bit of a physicist, a little bit of a mathematician, a little bit of a sociologist, I had to be a little bit of an economist, even a bit of an anthropologist, uh, and then I actually had to be a little bit of a, an amateur engineer. So the book is a, an interdisciplinary book, and that's always a, a nerve-wracking undertaking. You expect at any moment one expert or another to cry foul. But it seems to me that the effort was worthwhile. Let me make two broad uh, summaries. One of the historical narrative and the other of the six things I learned about networks as they apply to history. The narrative, which I'm going to simplify absurdly here, is that m in most of history, hierarchical structures of power dominate social networks. Now, this is something of a false dichotomy as the more uh, wonkish, geekish people will know. Uh, there isn't a clear dichotomy between the, the square and the tower, between the square where we, uh, we network and the tower where government, government happens. Actually, there's more of a continuum from hierarchically structured networks to distributed or decentralized networks. But I think one can summarize human history in the following way. Most of the time, hierarchically structured forms of organization predominate. Through most of history, states or armies or bureaucracies, hierarchically organized arrangements prevail, even at quite simple levels. The, the clan structure of early modern Scotland, if you want an example. But every now and then, uh, in a few periods in history, social networks are empowered, often by some technological change, in such a way that they challenge the hierarchical order of the time. Example, 
We think there's something tremendously new about our time because we have personal computers that fit in our pockets and the internet. But I try to argue that the effect of that technology and the network that it's created, to which we all belong, is comparable to the effect that the printing press had when it was introduced as a technology uh, in the 15th century. And that if Martin Luther had tried to launch his challenge against the Roman Catholic Church 501 years ago without the printing press, we'd never have heard of him or he'd only be known as one of many heretics that got burnt at the stake uh, ignominiously. The printing press allowed Luther's message to, as we would say, go viral because it was a distributed network allowing the extraordinary rapid dissemination of Luther's message. And that was what caused the huge disruption, uh, not just to organized religion in Western Europe, but to politics as well. So an argument I try to make in the book is that we're living through one of the great ages of networked revolution, of network disruption. Uh, and in our time, uh, the internet, the network of personal computers is disrupting established political institutions, also religious institutions, though it's been Islam that's been affected much more than Christianity by the new technology. But the hierarchical political structures that used to manage our affairs, the state, the political parties, these things turn out to be quite easily disrupted now that this giant social network has been empowered by personal computers and the internet. The second thing I want to do is, as I mentioned, the six things that I learned from this kind of work. Number one, you might think that creating an enormous social network, a planet where everything is connected and everyone is connected would be a really good idea and I've lost count of the number of times I've been told that everything will be awesome when we're all connected that message has been the Kool-Aid dished out in Silicon Valley for 20 years or more a global community is a phrase that Mark Zuckerberg likes to use well Martin Luther had the same delusion he thought that a priesthood of all believers would be created once everybody had a printed copy of the Bible and could have a direct relationship to God, not intermediated by a corrupt uh, priesthood. Lesson number one of network theory. The network is not a homogenous, happy, clappy community where everybody shares cat videos or Luther sermons. What happens in social networks, even quite small ones, is that they tend to polarize. There's something called homophily. Birds of a feather flock together. We all know this old saying. It turns out to be true. Luther expected the priesthood of all believers. What he got was 130 years of religious warfare between those who embraced his revolution, Protestants, and those who thought it was a heresy who launched the Counter-Reformation. In our time, if you graph the blogosphere, the Twitter sphere, if you graph the social networks that exist online in this country, the polarization is stunning. There is a conservative cluster and there is a liberal cluster. In the case of Twitter, Conservatives retweet conservatives mostly, and liberals retweet liberals mostly. Moreover, there is an inbuilt tendency in today's network platforms to exacerbate the polarization. For example, if you decide to tweet on a political subject, you, you will find that your tweet is 20% 20% more likely to be retweeted for every moral or emotive word you use. If you look at the kind of people who use Twitter for politics, it is people on the extremes of left and right who are more likely to use Twitter for politics. If you look at our 
legislators, the men and women uh, of the US Congress, it is the ones who are on the ideological extremes who have the most Facebook followers. I could go on. So the network turns out to have a natural propensity to polarize. The second thing I learned is the small world phenomenon. You all have heard the phrase six degrees of separation. We're all six degrees of separation from Monica Lewinsky. Some may be less than that in this town, but I'll, I'll assume that, that it's an average six, uh, or Kevin Bacon, the actor, or anybody you like. The small world observation is a fascinating one. It, it was studied by the sociologist Stanley Milgram, who ran an experiment to see just how many degrees of separation there were between two randomly selected Americans, someone in the Midwest and somebody in Boston. It turned out to be six or seven. So it really was six degrees of separation. That wasn't just a phrase, it was a reality. On Facebook, it's less than four degrees of separation and some insanely high proportion of humanity is now on Facebook. So the, the small world phenomenon is now a smaller world phenomenon. Why does this matter? Well, the world's shrinkage means that things spread more rapidly. Example, the Enlightenment spread more rapidly and further than the Reformation because the process of the world's shrinkage, in fact, has been an ongoing one. It's speeded up in our time, thanks uh, not least to Facebook, uh, but it's a continuum. The third point, in this increasingly tightly knit world, in this giant network, things go viral. You all know that. But why? So I learned that it's not just because your cat video is inherently fascinating that it goes viral and mine does not. Virality is as much about the structure of the network as the thing itself, whether it is a virus, literally, or metaphorically, a meme, to use Richard Dawkins's word. Network structure is as important as content, as the virus itself. That was the third, third thing I learned. And that's important because in this world of networks, crazy stuff goes viral as well as good stuff. That's not just some new discovery or new phenomenon. After the printing press had created a new community uh, of, uh, of a sort, it wasn't just uh, Luther's teaching that went viral. Uh, the idea that there, wit there were witches living amongst us also went viral. And one of the extraordinary features of the period after the Reformation was that in one Protestant country after another, including, of course, Massachusetts, witch crazes occurred. Because the crazy idea that people were witches, women were witches, spread virally. The network doesn't care if it's true or false. Fake news like witchcraft went viral in the 17th century the way equally crazy ideas go viral in our time. Let's see. The next insight that this book taught me is that networks are not static things. Networks never sleep. They constantly morph. Why? Because they're complex systems. Once they get to a certain uh, size, they, they're governed by those features we associate, those forces we associate with complexity. Emergent properties, phase transitions. That's unpredictable. In the book, you'll see graphs of networks, but don't get the impression from these snapshots that the networks are static things. Networks never sleep. And their transitions, their changes, can take us by surprise. A couple more points. Networks network. <laughs> they do. 
The internet itself is an, a network of networks. That was the original concept. And the way that networks network is fascinating. Sometimes networks can interact in the most creative way. But networks can also attack networks. We talk in this town especially a great deal about one particular uh, network attack. That was the attack launched by the Russian intelligence network on the American democratic system in 2016. This is a fascinating example of a network attack. It reveals, apart from anything else, one of the fundamental problems with network structures. They are bad at self-defense. One reason we incline towards hierarchical structures through most of history is that they are quite good at defense. <coughs> it's not the first time the Russians hacked a network. I tell the story of how the most exclusive intellectual network of all time, the Cambridge Apostles, the most lofty, high-minded, intellectually extraordinary network, got hacked by the KGB. This is a wonderful example of how networks can attack other networks. Three of the Cambridge spies, three of the famous five, were members of that society to which John Maynard Keynes had belonged in the 1920s and Lytton Strachey. By the 1930s, the KGB had penetrated it. And one of the most successful intelligence operations of all time. Much more successful than what they did in 2016, which, by the way, backfired in their faces completely. And it takes a network in this kind of a world to defeat a network. I'm quoting Stan McChrystal, who learnt that lesson the hard way in his battle against al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, it's a wonderful story that he tells in his own autobiography. It took that very hierarchical institution, the US Army, a long time to realize that it could not beat its adversary in Iraq other than by, m in some ways, imitating its network structure. One last point that I learned writing this book. Networks are profoundly inegalitarian. Yes, I know you all think that your netizens in a vast global democracy empowered to speak truth to power. But here's the bad news. In no social network that I have studied is the structure truly equal. There are very few social lattices in which each node, each individual has the same number of edges, the same number of connections. Imagine if we graphed you. Yes, you too are a social network. That's why you're here in this store, listening to me now. We could find out, probably from Mark Zuckerberg, a lot about you all, and we could graph it. We could find out who knew whom, who was connected to whom. And I can assure you that if we did that, it would very quickly become apparent that some of you are much better connected than others. Because in almost all social networks, there's an amazing inequality some people are network isolates. I used to be kind of like that. I didn't go out much. I would write books. It's quite shy and reticent. It's very Scottish. You know, I don't really want to be in a network. I don't trust anybody. The network isolates are probably here. There'll be some of you here tonight. It's OK. It's curable. <laughs> Just go on a book tour. But if we graph the network, there would also be some people. I wonder who they are. Maybe Katie. I kind of know everybody. And that's what the giant social networks are like, too. We thought there would be something democratic about the internet. We were duped. We were duped because in reality, this is a most unequal structure that's been created, not least because the ownership of the network itself is so concentrated in a very few hands. Now, I've summarized as best I could the narrative of the book and the argument of the book, the six things I learned writing it. What I haven't been able to do is convey to you one final thing. The way I structured this book was designed to make it the most readable thing I've ever written. And what did I do? I broke it up into 60 
amazingly short chapters, thinking it was time to run an experiment. So I've, I've written this book with a totally different structure from any book I've written before. You don't even need to read it in the order the chapters are written in. You just dive in. You just dive in and read the story of how the apostles were penetrated by the KGB. Or if you're the kind of person who's actually more interested in he who must not be named, because I am not going to mention the president's name tonight, because every, week, every day of this week I have been interviewed by people and what they have said is this. Before we get to the book, can we first ask you about... <laughs> and I'm done with that. I'm bored of him. I'm bored of him. But if you are interested in him, there's a whole section on why it was that networks decided the 2016 election. And one of my concluding thoughts is, the real lesson of 2016 is no Facebook, no he who must not be named. Without the network platforms, not just Twitter, but especially Facebook, the outcome of that election, which has changed all our lives, would have been different. Jürgen Habermas, the great German uh, philosopher, said that changes in the structure of the public sphere were often the most decisive things in history, and I agree with Jürgen Habermas. And this book is really about changes in the structure of the public sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living through one of the greatest changes in the public sphere ever to happen. It is as profound in its way as the change wrought by the printing press. The printing press was supposed to create a priesthood of all believers. The internet, a global community. If history has anything to teach us, it is the sobering thought that we may be just at the beginning of a period of network disruption, polarization, crazy stuff going viral, and widening inequality. And if that makes you feel nervous, the cure is to buy the book. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and so to questions. Um, let, let me go right away to the lady in the purple dress. Thank you. Um, Marshall McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. Yeah. But I don't hear anyone say that about the internet, even though both of them are media of connectivity. Yeah. And with the three networks of TV, we had a very effective social aggregator. Everyone met the Beatles at the same time. Everyone debated Vietnam on the same page. In contrast, purely by chance, I stumbled the other day on a glossary of the alt-right manosphere. 10 or 12 words. Uh, the word for woman was femoid, female android, denoting subhuman. So witches are still among us. Um, there was another word, uh, geotis, that rhymes with potus, but means god emperor of the United States. But you know, who knew? Um, the press hasn't picked up any of this, even though femoid dovetails perfectly with the biggest story of the day. And I think it's very interesting, given that a common language is very fundamental to a common culture. And here we have a language of exclusion that no one understands who isn't like-minded and doesn't appreciate what chads and femoids and incels are. So I'm just sort of wondering if the medium is the message for the internet, is it invariably a message of accelerated cultural disaggregation or can it be turned around? And does your book go into the alt-right manosphere as part of this trend? Great question. Uh, yes, the medium uh, is the message. I, I quote that in the book. And yes, the book attempts to uh, explain the role that that strange subculture, the alt-right, 
uh, subculture uh, of Reddit f and, and so forth uh, played a role uh, in the election. Sam Lesson wrote a great essay recently. He used to be at, at Facebook. And the essay made the point that it's not just the filter bubbles or echo chambers we should worry about. That, that's a kind of conventional reading of the problem, and I, I kind of alluded to that with my polarization story. He said the real problem is that because of the way that Facebook works, and also Google, because of the way that the algorithm is sending you stuff that is designed to get you engaged, on an individualized basis, according to your data, we each inhabit our own private sphere, and the disaggregation that you describe is further advanced than we know. What made the advertising so potent in 2016, not only, by the way, in the United States, it happened in the UK too in the Brexit referendum, was the ability that the Brexit campaign had and the Trump campaign had to target advertising very, very specifically and then tweak the advertising in, on the basis of its uh, effectiveness. This is a completely changed public sphere. Political advertisements are no longer things we all see and can discuss at the water cooler. Each of us begins to inhabit uh, his or her own reality with our own customized uh, news feed. This is a deeply dangerous development because it means the public sphere as such ceases to exist or retreats into the domain of traditional media. Traditional media, of course, slowly being destroyed uh, because they lose uh, with every passing month their share of advertising revenue to the network platforms. So I sense a more profound crisis of democracy than we yet appreciate because we are focused on what I think are relatively small issues, the Russian intervention. The Russian intervention wasn't decisive. The number of advertisements and the number of people who saw them were really, really small percentages of all the content that was being produced indigenously by Americans on Facebook, not least the people that you alluded to. So I think this is a deeply troubling development, and it's where the book ends. The book ends by saying if we allow this networked world to, to advance, it will transpire that the real enemy of democracy is not the Russians. Uh, the real enemy is actually the way the network uh, platform algorithms subdivide us, dice and slice us, and give each of us our own version of reality. So thanks for the great question. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask a quick question. Since the, you admit the power of networks, it's one step to presume that there is a possibility of large-scale conspiracies. Do you believe that large-scale conspiracies capable to change the history can happen or happened before in our history? I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked that question because part of the reason for writing this book is precisely that conspiracy theorists have dominated the literature on social networks for such a long time. I was really struck when I was uh, researching this by a little statistic that I'm going to get right. Uh, in 2011, just over half of Americans agreed with the statement that, quote, much of what happens in the world today is decided by a small and secretive group of individuals. And I belong to it. I do. I must do. Because I go, not this year because I'm busy selling books, to the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's worse than that. I go to the Bilderberg meeting. <laughs> it's quite likely that having written a book about the Rothschilds and Henry Kissinger and knowing George Soros, that <laughs> I am a member of the Illuminati, who are, of course, controlled by space aliens, Wait, stop. You lost me at space aliens. So here's the extraordinary thing. Most of the work that you can find out there on the internet, on any of the things I just talked about, from the Rothschilds to the Illuminati, is by crazy people. And the conspiracy theory landscape is kind of fun to wander through, but it is entirely divorced from scholarship. In conspiracy theory land, you just make stuff up. Which is, I mean, I, I guess it's entertaining, but it isn't history. Part of the problem there is that real historians, 
who are more nervous and, uh, and risk-averse temperamentally than this historian shy away, therefore, from writing about any of these things. So you don't actually get many books about the role of the Freemasons in the American Revolution that are non-crazy. There are relatively few rigorous studies of the Illuminati and so forth. So one reason I wanted to write this book was that so much that there is about social networks is the conspiracy theory industry. Uh, when you actually do serious historical research, which you can do on, say, the Illuminati, you discover that they were a small South German secret society set up in the 1770s with the goal of secretly infiltrating the Masonic lodges uh, of Europe and spreading thereby the most radical doctrines of the Enlightenment, including atheism. So the Illuminati did exist, but there were only ever about 2,000 members. They spent a lot of time doing really strange rituals uh, inspired by Freemasonry and giving one another strange code names. And they were completely shut down by the Bavarian authorities in the 1780s, making it highly unlikely that yeah. they caused the French Revolution, as was subsequently alleged. <laughs> so part of the point of this book is to, to show that we can write the history uh, of those secret societies, but we must not exaggerate their power. That there isn't really a conspiracy to rule the world run out of Davos. I know I've been. I mean, and frankly, if that's what they call ruling the world, I mean, they should give up now. <laughs> so when you get closer to these alleged centers of secret power, which half of Americans believe in, what's really kind of disappointing is that there's no there there. You kind of wander around Davos in the snow saying, so where, where's the meeting that decides what happens next year? <laughs> And they say, you mean next year's program? No, no, I mean, what happens next year? Who, you know, who wins the election, that stuff? There is no meeting. They're not in control. And the Illuminati don't exist anymore. Let me take a question from over here. Um, I wanted to see if you have anything to comment or your research uh, gave any insights to sort of a lot of the public uh, commentaries about tribalism as a source of a lot of the polarization. But if you were to flip the angle to say that we don't have enough uh, social networks right. of the past to yeah. give us that bonding, that sort of created this loneliness epidemic. Right. And maybe it's the pace of information is way too fast that we can't, uh, we can't process it. So we have to simplify it into these sound bites. Plus, technology promotes that to make everything overly simple. Um, but maybe what's really lacking is uh, connectedness because the pace of life is faster. The public sphere is just sort of evaporating. Right. A very interesting question is whether or not the online social networks are uh, displacing or even destroying uh, traditional local uh, social networks based on actual sociability. And, and the literature on this, I mean, it's quite a lot of it by sociologists, is somewhat divided. But I think I, I incline to the view that there is a steady attrition. I mean, this goes back to Bowling Alone and Charles Murray's coming apart. There's been a steady attrition of associational life at the local level. And, and this seems to correlate quite closely with the explosion of online, online activity. And just look how much time people spend. It's astonishing on their, on their mobile devices on Facebook and on, on other network platforms. Uh, we are not designed by evolution to have millions of friends. We're not really capable of a good deal more than 100. Ask yourself how many holiday cards you sent this year. If it was more than 100, uh, you definitely need to remove some people from that list. It's <laughs> not really in our nature to maintain such complex uh, networks especially networks that are not based on interaction in real time and real space. The epidemic of loneliness, indeed depression, that's being reported on, indeed Facebook itself admitted that there's a problem just the other day amongst young people, I think is extremely important. And those of you who are parents, make sure they don't become addicted to these devices. Don't give them iPhones at an early age. Ration access to the screens. The real cure, though, is not just sociability. We're engaged in what is a traditional 
social activity. A meeting in a bookshop to talk about a book. That is so 18th century, people. I mean, it's just... <laughs> I, f I just love that because, I mean, that's what made the Scottish Enlightenment happen, except in the Scottish Enlightenment, we'd all have been drinking for at least two hours be <laughs> before anybody started talking. But that's, I think, uh, one of the antidotes. But the other antidote, the other antidote is books. You know, what I find really distressing is the sense that the long form itself is being destroyed uh, by the 180 characters uh, addiction. So... Uh, it's not just that we need to socialize in those ways that we are evolved to socialize in, but we also need to make sure that we can still get through 500 pages without checking our email, our Twitter feed, etc. Shall I take another question from here? Again, accelerating my pace of reply. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a fellow Kissinger biographer, Peter Dixon. Yeah, I don't know if you were Hello, right. Peter. <laughs> How nice to see you. Now, just a, two quick observations, one relating to Kissinger, because you have a lot in the mm -hmm. book here, and then one on powerful hierarchies that use networks for self-survival. Um, I looked in the index for Kissinger, but I was looking for the neoconservatives. Where were the neoconservatives yeah. here? You're right. <laughs> and. Uh, my sense of Kissinger early on, going back to the 70s and 80s, his real clique, setting aside his global Rolodex, which you go into, was very small group of men. And most of them are dead now, except maybe for Scowcroft. And of course, yeah. Kissinger just right. turned, I think, 95. Right. I think that it was a case if a, if a political faction within the foreign policy elite doesn't institutionalize it more, and that was what he said was Bismarck's failure, mm. that Kissinger was overpowered over time by the neocons. Yeah. I will say, though, he still gets his access, and in fire and fury, he is very close to Jared Kushner, <laughs> uh, pushing him toward China in a certain way and so forth. We're so not here to sell I, that book, I, yeah, just I, to be I fair. Think that, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, sometimes uh, networks and factions can die out or pass out if they're not instituted. The other question is, uh, observation is, some uh, hierarchies, old and, old and new, uh, can really sustain themselves through networks. And I think of the Catholic Church is one of the most hierarchical institutions with the Jesuits and the Franciscans and the monasteries and the whole hierarchy uh, is able, was able to sustain itself for a very long time. Uh, the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire created the Janissaries <laughs> to sustain the empire, which was very much a clique. And then Hitler was very astute in using the radio and the airplane, as you know, in Germany in the 20s and 30s. So he used new technology to create a mass following, but he had the Gestapo and the SS, which were classic networks that he created. and. Uh, I, I, I just would like to see if you have any comments on either of Well, what's great, Peter, about your question is you're showing that once you start thinking about the world in this way, you start thinking about everything in this way. And, of course, uh, I couldn't include every single network that's been powerful uh, in American politics, but I certainly could have written about the neoconservative network, uh, which became a major uh, threat to Kissinger's position in the 19. 70s. Let me make a confession. One reason I decided to write this book was to try to cleanse my intellectual palate before writing volume two of Kissinger. I realized that I was, I was needing a new conceptual framework for the second volume because the first volume was essentially an intellectual biography as somewhat uh, akin to your own work. Uh, the story of, 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 of a scholar essentially entering the, the public domain, but essentially somebody who could be understood in his own words. The second volume I realized had to be about the Kissinger network in some measure to explain how this scholarly figure became so powerful. So in this book, I have a first stab at the Kissinger network. It's really just the first attempt at it to try to, to depict it, to try to understand uh, how far his power was a function of his ability to build a network, which I, thi I think is the hypothesis of volume too. But this is work in progress. I do think it is an extremely important way of thinking about the transitions in American politics uh, within the parties. Uh, and, and the rise of the neocons is without question a good subplot 
uh, for a future edition. The Catholic Church illustrates the need to be at some measure, in some measure both hierarchical and networked to survive. The hybrid structure, people who work in, on networks in, in biology know this, is actually in some ways the best in nature. There is a hierarchical dimension, but the Roman Catholic Church is not the Soviet Union under Stalin. The Pope does not micromanage each priest in every part uh, of uh, the Catholic Empire's global domain. Uh, and this is an important clue as to why it's been so long-lived. Most institutions that are hierarchically structured, say corporations, don't last very long. They're really surprisingly short-lived. Institutions that live a long time seem to have a hybrid structure that combines the organizational discipline of hierarchy with the creativity of networks at the grassroots level. And finally, it is a crying shame that no one has yet done a, a systematic social network analysis of either the Bolshevik Party or the Nationalist so National Socialist Party. Uh, we've got great work, it's true, on some of the great uh, 18th century intellectual networks, but I can't help feeling we could be solving some very burning problems of historical explanation if we could understand <coughs> better how those two parties, which grew so rapidly, which had all the characteristics of of viral phenomena, which fundamentally transformed politics in the 20th century and were responsible for the greatest conflicts uh, in human history. But we don't know how those networks were structured. Uh, so one of my works in progress is at least an article on the NSDAP as a network. Until that work is done, the raw material are there, the data are there, but historians haven't done it. Uh, and until that work is done, I don't think we'll fully understand fascism itself nor communism. Shall I take a, yep. another question from over here? So you talked a little bit how, sorry, you talked a little bit how networks can occasionally rise up and challenge sometimes toppling hierarchies. So pivoting to China a little bit, that seems to be one of the largest networks in the world that's being controlled by one of the largest hierarchies in the world. Yes. Do you think the nature of that system makes it particularly vulnerable to a certain shock that might come about soon? What a terrific question. The book addresses this question and, and comes to a quite different conclusion from the one implied by your question. We haven't solved the problem. In the United States, we have not resolved the paradox that private companies now know more about the citizens than the state, indeed, than the citizens themselves. We haven't resolved the problem that the, the power has fundamentally shifted from Washington to Silicon Valley. They've solved it in China. And they've solved it in the following way. First, they excluded the American technology companies from their territory, in effect. Certainly made it extremely difficult for them to establish themselves. Then they allowed their own versions to, f uh, to form and grow. Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. And then they made it clear to Jack Ma and company that they were clearly subordinate to the party. And the big data that those companies have gathered about China's citizens are available on demand to Xi Jinping. Now, you may not like that solution, and I certainly don't, but it is a consistent answer to the question, what do we do now? That means, in my view, that the Chinese Communist Party has much better prospects of extending its survival than it had just 10 years ago. Because now it knows exactly what its citizens are thinking. It has big data on almost every aspect of behavior, from the economic to the social to the cultural. They can monitor and respond. No totalitarian regime in the mid-20th century came even close to this level of knowledge about individual citizens and their collective behavior. It is astonishing to see the evolution of a system of social credit. Uh, this isn't just your credit rating if you want a mortgage. No, no, this is how well have you behaved in the eyes of the party how far have you conformed to Xi Jinping thought? I've just gone back, come back from China, I was there just last week. It's extraordinary, and Orwell and Huxley, we need to revise. We need some new guide to the new totalitarianism of big data. Uh, so I, I think this is the really interesting story. There's a confidence in Beijing that I haven't detected there before a sense that the world is going their way. 
And this is part of it. Go to Hangzhou. Talk to the folks at Alibaba and, uh, and Ant. They know that they're already ahead because they're not constrained by notions of privacy. And they're not constrained by the idea that there should be some separation between party, state, and the private sector. So I think it's fascinating. Could something blow this up? One thing. They have created the biggest bourgeoisie in history. Now I'm going to sound exactly like a Marxist. <laughs> I, I am a Marxist. I'm just on the side of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> The biggest bourgeoisie in history, and although they may be able to monitor the thoughts of that new middle class, they can't alter the fact that like every middle class in history, it wants certain things that have implications. Property rights. It wants the security of its property rights. You make money in China, you don't really know if you can hang on to it. You don't know when it might be confiscated. The desire for property rights leads to the desire for rule of law, leads to the desire for accountability of the executive. And for only so long can people be fobbed off with an anti-corruption campaign over which they have no control and which can, in fact, be arbitrary and a kind of political tool in its own right. So I'm going to watch for the bourgeois revolution in China. But so is Xi Jinping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, 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 take, I'll take one more question, and I'll take it from Jim. Jim has a special claim. I'll have the last question. As my, yeah. my volunteer proofreader from Virginia. And, and i got to tell you, that was Peter Dixon up here. I know. And he spells his last name the same way as I spell my last name. You may be related in some elaborate genealogical network. <laughs> Remember, that's the original network. I didn't talk about it this evening, but family trees are really where this whole story begins. The networks that shape, for example, uh, Florence in the time of the Medici were family networks. That's what I initially studied with the Rothschilds. The Royal House of saxe coburg Gotha was the great royal family network uh, of the 19th century. So yes, the Dixon network. One day there'll be a book about that. Well, Neil, same question as three hours ago. Being 68 years old and it took you 10 years to do volume one, can you hurry it up? What kind of timeline do we got for volume two? I, I think it's very cruel to ask someone who's just published a book <laughs> <laughs> when the next book will be published. Uh, I, I'm going to answer conservatively, conservatively about three years uh, from now. Uh, that's my commitment to you and my publisher. I think I can make it. So hang in there, uh, Jim. Jim that, that book will be, that will, be, will be written. And who knows, it may end up having the subtitle the network or the networker, I haven't quite decided. I think this might be the moment at which we proceed from uh, bloviation uh, to book signing. And I'd like to thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>